just have a question because this is not my area of experience. How are you able to pin down those emissions to the shipping uh, itself? Are there um, is it a particular type of emission or that, that doesn't come from other sources or how are you able to pin that down? In the, in the, uh, in the larger global studies, uh, in looking at, uh, at, at what's in the atmosphere, uh, you can look for signatures in the kinds of uh, combustion and fuels that are combined in the different sectors. A, a diesel powered bus does not contain nearly the, the sulfur signature. So uh, you, can, you can look for those kinds of combinations. There are the, the, uh, what's left after you distill a barrel of fuel is not just a leftover high quantity of sulfur and a very thick black asphalt looking type of fuel, but there's also metals and other sorts of things that scientists can trace. So there's, there's that. I think what I will also do is, is sort of toss it back to Simon, it, because in terms of the inventories, um, you, we can tell you what the emissions are because we start at the deck plate. Simon, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think there are two parts of uh, our answers, actually. Um, what the work I've been doing is to calculate, to estimate emissions per ton in quantity. And then with the uh, information regarding where and how the vessels are being distributed spatially within Hong Kong water, uh, we can then plot all the emissions uh, to a map to show you where the emissions are being emitted, now where it is being emitted. Of course, once any pollutants being emitted, there will be uh, different mechanisms where these pollutants will be carried to, a, uh, to the point of reception or exposure. That's what uh, Jim's been talking about. So at the point of reception by you know, some traces of maybe metal or other you know, uh, uh, chemicals, we can then tell you know, what type of, uh, what, what are the sources of these pollutants. Uh, so this is two, two part of the answers to your questions. So I'm dealing with the uh, emission end and uh, James' answer is actually say, uh, answering uh, the part of the uh, reception end. Just one more quick thing. That's very, it's a very important question. Uh, because the Pearl River Delta region has a lot of marine activity in a lot of locations. But there will be times in the year when you will be able to point around the delta and say, well, today's uh, air mass, the pollution air cloud that came today, seems to have come from over there. But there will be an, a large number of days, maybe more than some have expected, where the activity within the Hong Kong waters will be the source of the air mass that comes over communities and contributes to the high, uh, high observed pollution levels in that area. I can also add a piece of information. Uh, Civic Exchange together with HKUST, we used the data for 2006 to look at, for the whole year, so every day, we looked at uh, which, which were the dominant, which was the dominant source of air pollution that affected Hong Kong. Because people in Hong Kong always said, well, you, you know, the, the massive an, uh, amount of pollution is coming from across the border. Uh, if we're looking at total quantity of emissions, uh, yes, that's true. But, you know, as, as, as we reminded ourselves, there's uh, 40 million people living there, you know, with a thumping uh, manufacturing uh, uh, economy. Uh, in Hong Kong, we only have 7 million people. It's a very small geographical area. So obviously, if you're looking at relative uh, quantities of emission, generally we'll say there's a lot more coming from there. But what, what we wanted to know from uh, that piece of research is on a day-to-day -day basis, what is the dominant pollution affecting us? So for example, if, if, the, if, if factories were emitting, uh, let's say in Foshan, uh, in Guangdong, which is one of the more polluted areas, it doesn't mean that in Hong Kong on every day, that is the pollution that is affecting us. Right? So by looking at uh, uh, all the data for a whole year, the scientists at HKUST were able to show that 53% of the time, the dominant, not the only, but the dominant pollution affecting Hong Kong were, were our own emissions. So they were then able to slice out. Uh, 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 those days included, obviously, power plants, transportation, as well as vessels. So as Jim said, by looking at the signature uh, of the pollutants you're able to pick up from different places, you could say, ah, well, you know, this is, this is really transportation fuel. Or this is, well, has a very high sulfur content, 
this is probably coming from the ships. So we were able to actually articulate a very new uh, uh, formulation uh, of pollution characteristics in Hong Kong. And I think the government uh, accepted that broad reframing, which is, well, if we cleaned up our own sources in Hong Kong, it will have a tremendous benefit on public health. It doesn't bring you blue sky, right? because yes, we need to work very hard with Guangdong to clean up the pollution there, but if we cleaned up what is closest to us, to our noses, huh, then it will have a tremendous beneficial impact. Um, any other questions? Oh, wow. Oh, I'm going to have to leave it to Yan Yan. Who do you want to pick? <laughs> uh, uh, morning. My name is Edwin Tang, clearly here. Yeah. Uh, one question is, you know, um, fair wind um, charter is very good, mapping very good. I would suggest if we can put some, you know, suggestions that the ocean going vessel can be installed monitoring system, you know, so to help out international data because with the bad weather and all these changes, I think this is a good start to have, you know, information collected and gathered into a central place. Uh, and some of the river vessel also, you know, this way, those data can be collected not just by UST, but from everywhere on a daily basis, centralized and be monitored and can be used and see how to improve. This is the, my suggestions. Thank you. Well, I, I think the NGOs are always going to want as much data as possible. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, but but perhaps I mean Simon, you can say a little bit more because you are getting data from uh, from 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 the sh the ship owners and the ship liners, who are measuring their own emissions. Yeah, sure. Well, I think uh, as far as you know, uh, getting data and doing measurements and come up with you know numbers and then translate that into policy is concerned. We always have to try and strike a balance. I'm not saying that you know on board monitoring is not a good idea. But of course, if you consider the number of vessels that we are talking about worldwide, uh, even only the river vessels that's operating in this region, we have like you know thousands and thousands of vessels, and to do that, uh, a lot number of questions will then quickly pop up: who is going to pay? Whether it's technically feasible to do it on every vessels? And then of course we have to think about the efficiency of you know installing how many of the vessels to get the most efficient amount of numbers that enable us to you know do the estimation. Now, if we uh, now theor th theoretically, if we can put, you know, a measuring a measuring machine monitoring uh, device to every vessel, of course, then we can get number one real time data, and then number two, we cover all the vessels. But to cover the population and to come up with, you know, the, the data that actually we need to you do that, we have thing. hundreds of thousands of vessels, right, that are coming in and out of the Hong Kong port. Yeah. But it's, it's probably less than hundreds of thousands of vessels individually, but it's the numbers of trips. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the call for more data, especially at the individual vessel level, is, is very, very appealing. But I, 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 to I agree with Simon. The patterns in the activity are more useful in predicting the patterns of pollution that matter to public health. Uh, I would suggest that, that uh, the, the fair winds vessels themselves might have each wished that they could have proved how much they individually contributed to the to the benefits that uh, that, uh, that EPD talked about earlier but um, but the uh, you, we get a, quite a bit of value out of the kinds of uh, publicly available work that that uh, Simon's going to be able to release from the aggregate and getting the patterns the seasonality etc I think that monitoring the vessels as they improve to verify their improvement will be much more critical for enforcement. Uh, yes, to continue on that, because we have in Europe also tried to calculate this, and as you, we spoke about it yesterday, Simon, and, and maybe this is a big, big challenge. And also it's a bit valuable that we, when we use this assumption, I think the value of that is that we can compare. So it's not all that bad to use assumption if we all use the same base because then we can compare different regions in the world, we, they, this will be worldwide acceptable assumption. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's a huge problem to, to assume if we all use the same background. But what you're m mentioning is even more important when you come to, as you said, enforcement. As in Europe, we do have legislation and I showed yesterday that we have found that the compliance rate is not very high. What we're doing is, um, 
we are it's compulsory for the member state to take field samples on board. We have found that it's only, unfortunately, only one sample out of 1,000 vessels being taken. So we don't know about the 999 other vessels what they're running on. We can only assume that they are complying by the rules, but unfortunately, we don't think that's true. So we would love to have to have monitoring, continuous monitoring on board. Unfortunately, it's not possible. What is possible, though, is for those who don't use the low sulfur fuel, who use a technical measure to lower the sulfur levels, they are uh, obliged to have continuous monitoring to show that they do reach the same emission levels as if it would use low sulfur fuel. And in addition, in Europe, we have a, a pilot project. This is very much a pilot, so I don't take this on board. I will just mention it. Uh, we're also looking at air surveillance. Uh, that you ha can have airplanes that can fly over a ship and see what the sulfur levels are. This is, as I said, very much a pilot. We don't know if it will work, but it would be absolutely terrific because what we could do in the SECAS areas is just fly over, have an indication. It wouldn't legally, and I'm a lawyer, it wouldn't legally be possible to do anything with it. But what we could do is through the ship reporting data that we have, see what the next protocol is, and we would phone the, the port state and say, here you have a ship that we have indication that that had too high sulfur level. Can you please check it? So the, the, I would say the issue of continuous monitoring is on the table. We would love to have it. It's very, very difficult, though. So we, this is something I think on a global level we're looking at. OK, thank you. Please. Um, Joseph Lewis, City University um, School of Energy and Environment. Um, I don't like to go back to the fuel, which is actually the real problem. And I'd like to ask, um, you know, there are no um, fuel suppliers on your list of sponsors. What kind of work are you doing to relate to the fuel suppliers? What kind of harmonization is there on what they're producing? And I would have thought that ports are extremely controlled areas. Surely if you can get your fuel harmonization to a certain level, and maybe introduce some biofuels as well, um, you've engaged the majority of the problem. I'd just also like to ask what about the illicit uh, fuels? So there are quite a lot of little bits, but all basically back to how can you uh, get a harmonization of the fuel standards worldwide? Right, I think uh, I'll see who wants to answer that. But I just want to say, uh, amongst our stakeholders, We've worked very closely with the fuel suppliers, and they've come to all our stakeholder gatherings because, of course, having the uh, low, having having consistent supply of uh, low sulfur fuel is critical. I, I, I will um, I will simply maybe offer myself for discussion later as well. I um, in the last two years I've spoken, and this this year coming I expect to be involved with an international bunker conference, which is a a meeting of all of the major marine fuels providers, their brokers, and their customers um, that, uh, that occurs. There's a similar sort of meeting in, in the Asia region, which I have not had the pleasure to attend, but the one in Northern Europe. The, uh, the oil majors themselves and the marine bunker portions of the business are very keen on understanding the supply and demand for this fuel. Um, there's... there's um, there's a long-term, very long-term trend, it's not one to invest optimism in, in terms of this region, that um, when you take a barrel of crude oil and you try to make things to sell, you would like to make things that sell for higher than the price of the barrel. That's a good way to make money. A good way to lose money is to make lots of stuff that sells for less than the price of the barrel of crude oil. Marine fuels sell for less than the price of a barrel of crude oil. Um, despite and including the data that you saw from, it not, does not contradict the data you saw from OOCL. The marine sector, and before that, the marine and stationary power sectors took advantage of lower prices for these fuels that had qualities who um, were not very high. And they designed their systems so that they could um, combust those. It's sort of like an, uh, designing an advanced engine that's omnivore, once it can eat residual fuel, it can handle anything. 
Um, these are very advanced engines that have been invested in over decades since I was a, before I was a cadet, and uh, they were matched to be robust against those fuels. That's that notwithstanding. The North American refining sector now only makes, out of a barrel of crude oil, only makes about 3% residual for marine fuels. In, in Europe, the refining complexity is not quite as advanced. They make about 11% residual. And um, the rest of the world, and I, I couldn't get it more specific to here now, it's around 17%. When I was in school in the 80s, a barrel of crude oil produced 23% residual. So what's been happening is that we've been working hard, the refineries have been working hard on their own investment paces, not driven by environment, to maximize high value distillates and to reduce the low value residuals into the market. We're at the point now where since the 1950s this is the only petroleum product that I know of whose quality has never improved. It's only degraded. And so now we have this issue. But, but I don't want you to think that the oil majors themselves or their uh, bunker providers are uh, ignorant of the fact. What happens now, of course, is they have many more degrees of freedom, many more uh, variables to be worried about as they try to move back toward cleaner fuel mixes. Uh, there's a number of things that an engine needs in order to run stably. And when you just take the sulfur out, you screw up about three of those other things. So uh, it, it's a very important question. Just a comment on the biofuels, which I find very interesting, is a priority for the European Union to have more renewable fuels, so it's a high priority. So uh, that is something that we're looking into, and as a first step to that, uh, it would, could be to use what we call the liquid gas, LNG, it's called the shipping terms. That if you would have an engine that could run an LNG, you could easily switch it to biofuels. So that is uh, the concept. If you buy the buy ship, LNG ship fuel today, you could change it to buy fuels later on. So we are hoping that this could be the first step to see that happening. But And we are very, very much pushing for this LNG. Uh, we have seen uh, quite a few orders in Europe to have LNG. However, having said that, this is mostly for ships on fixed routes. I don't know how common that is in this region, but that have the only, maybe for the Makai ferries, or ferries that goes regularly, they can bunker easily because you have to have another infrastructure in place. But I agree with you, of course, this is what we all want to go in, in the far end of things, and because we then touch upon even reducing the greenhouse gases, which will also will be the next step of this process, of course. So I, I agree that this is an issue that you shouldn't lose, because we think by going in that direction, we cut all the emissions at once. That, and that is what we want to achieve in then. Yeah, uh, Matthew Flynn from Flynn Consulting. Um, I really thought it important to um, you know acknowledge and applaud the work that was done by Civic Exchange and also the um, Fair Hong Kong Liner Association in terms of what they've achieved for the Fairwinds Charter. I mean that's in a unique breakthrough that has no, really never happened, been initiated elsewhere anywhere else on the face of the earth. So you know first of all you know that's that is a fantastic result um, to, that really should be acknowledged. Um, the, the second um, question point really directed at uh, 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 Tony and Teddy um, relates to, in Tony, your presentation, you were saying that, that the next steps would be something at birth for ocean-going vessels or else something that was taken on by, and that's a, a city-level initiative, versus something that could be done, you know, regionally cross-border, and then after that, the, the, you know, the highest step would be in ECA itself. And that would be really multilateral. So we've got you know city level bi bilateral and then multilateral initiatives. This would be best case scenario. And as Ms. Berglund said, that you know compliance is vital. So the the, the fact that the liner shipping association is really willing to actually you know kind of sail into this era of legislation is is an advantage. So my question really is to get us to each of these these steps, you know Hong Kong level regional level, and then possibly an ECA, what has to happen to get us to that, to that future? Of course, working together between, with industry and also with the support of the, uh, the liner companies as well. Okay, um, thank you for your questions. Now, uh, actually, these three, initi three initiatives are not mutually exclusive, so we can pursue them in parallel. Uh, for, um, 
for improving the fuel quality supplied at home, I, I think uh, the best thing we have to do is to secure the support and the consensus of the stakeholders, especially the, uh, the vessel operators, the vessel owners. Well, because um, from our experience with uh, the, um, the trial of using ultra-low silver diesel that we launched in the past two years, well, this trial was mentioned by our secretary, Edward Yao. Well, I share the view that the main concern of the ship operators is that, well, is this fuel compatible, compatible with my engine? Because, uh, well, some may suspect that since it has a lower silver content, well, its lubricity may be different. Its uh, properties may be different. Will it be compatible with my engine? So the first thing is, the most important and most crucial point is we have to ease their concern to, um, to get their support. Well, I, I think this is, is the most important. The second point is we have to make sure that the supply of the new fuel and the old fuel, the price difference is not too great or minimal. Well, because nowadays the operation cost is quite, an, quite a key issue for the operators. So we have to make sure that we get the, um, we get the best information from the oil companies we get the information according to, uh, of the uh, international fuel prices to make sure that there won't be any great uh, difference in the price differential between the two fuels. And for the um, regional cooperation plans, that is the uh, emission, uh, that is, well, the first one is the uh, fuel switch at birth. I think, well, our ultimate goal is to have a, a regional requirement across the border in the Pearl River Delta waters. So the uh, cooperation with our neighboring ports in the uh, Perth River Delta, mainly uh, Guangdong and Shenzhen, uh, is crucial. So uh, along this line, to this to this front, we will pursue the regional cooperation with them and uh, keep keep up the momentum in doing this. And for the uh, eager, the eager is a bit different. It's a long-term goal because we need to see uh, where ultimately eager is uh, to be uh, to be pursued under the framework of MAPR and S6 and is to be the application is to, to be submitted by the central people's government by virtual as uh, by virtue of its status as a country member of MAPR. So we have to ultimately see the support of the central people's government in order to bring this into uh, come true. So uh, this is the most and, crucial point. And that requires a lot of evidence. Uh, to be submitted to IMO, so. Yeah, correct. So that's why we need a long-term time frame because uh, we need to uh, do a lot of studies and follow a very, very elaborate procedures yeah. in order to submit it, in order to submit the uh, applications and to prove that uh, we have already done enough to clean up our land-based sources and to justify why we now need to go to an ECA such a stringent requirement. So I think yes, then maybe I can just summarize this very quickly. These, all these steps, right? something that Hong Kong can do on its own, something that Hong Kong has to do together with the neighbors, something that uh, to do it internationally, we need the national government in Beijing to make an application. So you could see all of these things, some can take less time than others. I mean, obviously, if you're looking at the international situation, that's going to take uh, uh, probably some years. We're talking about years, not months. Perhaps something that we can control ourselves in Hong Kong that can take in a matter of uh, perhaps month and maybe a year. And then the regional th discussion obviously will also take some time. So uh, 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 the question, the challenge for us in Hong Kong is, what is the level of support in Hong Kong for the government to act? Uh, what are some of the things that we need to trial and test and pilot here? Because even if something works technically, you know, different fuels and engines is not really a problem, if people in the trade are not comfortable, their engineers haven't tried it before and they want to, you know, they want to see if it really works, you need to kind of have a buffer period of time for this to happen. So how can we short, you know, shorten those times? Then again, uh, one of the things we're very concerned about is you have the Fairwinds Charter, it's going to run for another 13th month. How can we get new members to join? And can, can we really continue to punish the good, which is that these people are, are, are using their own profits to, uh, uh, to, to, to do this, and then the people who are not joining, in fact, are having a competitive advantage. So what is the public willing to do? What can government do to ensure that we don't, you know, we don't lose the benefit of the Fairwinds Charter in the first two years? So these are, these, are, um, uh, these are really the policy discussions that we need to have in Hong Kong. 
Uh, other questions, comments? Please do email. Teddy, if please. I may. Just a quick point. Hong Kong Island Shippers Association has different types of members. Uh, we have members more more international, if I may. There's a company serving between Asia and uh, Europe, North America. But we also have uh, member lines serving within the region. So they have bigger concern because probably by experience, uh, uh, shipping lines serving Europe and North America, they know it. They, they know all these field switching can be done, uh, certainly with uh, training to the staff to ensure the safety of the ship. Because when there is field switching, we are talking about uh, not just like a home switch, you switch off and on, the machine is huge, so it takes some time. So marine safety is certainly a bigger hassle than just uh, fuel switching. So to to en to at least the support of these regional operators uh, is also very important uh, to get the um, joint effort more fruitful. Thank you. Very helpful. Uh, yes, please. Yeah.